Yep. Okay, thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, carbene metal amides, which are a uh, relatively um, new uh, class of uh, emitting materials to be used in high efficiency organic light emitting diodes and OLEDs. Uh, I'm also going to talk about how some of their material properties affect device performance and especially the uh, emission color of the devices. Um, I'll show how we can use them in uh, host free devices, which is quite an interesting result, uh, including with uh, high efficiency. Um, and how that can uh, open up new, um, open up kind of additional channels for um, device optimization and uh, to investigate their properties. Uh, okay, so by way of some brief introduction, and uh, I know this will be very familiar to a lot of people, but in an OLED, when you um, when you inject charges from both electrodes, so holes coming from one side of the device and electrons coming from the other device, their spins are non-correlated. So when they meet and form an exciton, they do so with a, a random spin in a random spin state, and so they form twenty-five percent singlet excitons and 75% triplet excitons. Uh, in a conventional fluorescent material, um, this would be a big problem because the, those triplet excitons would not usually be emissive. And so you, uh, so you impose a very severe restriction on the quantum efficiency of your material in your device. There are two main ways to, to get around this and to try to increase the um, increase the emission that you get from states originating as trip excitons. The first is to introduce a heavy metal into your material, such as iridium here. Uh, and when you do so, you uh, increase the spin orbit coupling strength of the material uh, to further kind of mix spin states and you can um, induce phosphorescence directly from the triplet to the single ground state. The second approach is even in the absence of heavy heavy elements, is to uh, separate the wave function of electrons in the homo pneumo uh, of your material. And so you can, uh, in the excited state, the, the two kind of electrons involved in an exciton will be confined to donor and acceptor moieties in your molecule. And this um, reduces the uh, electronic strength of the electron exchange interaction uh, and hence brings the singlet and triplet energy levels a bit closer to each other, such that at normal uh, device operating temperatures, you can have this thermal activation and uh, reverse inter-system crossing from the, the triplet exciton to the singlet, where you can then get fluorescence. Um, this is uh, the concept of thermally activated delayed fluorescence, or TADF. Um, both of these approaches have um, at least one drawback, and that's that the um, excited state lifetime tends to be quite long, greater than microseconds or uh, multiple microseconds. And especially as you try to move towards blue emitting devices, this means that the uh, the energy density, which can build up and can build up to be quite high uh, in your device, and you can end up breaking bonds and causing problems with um, material and device stability. Um, so the, material, the materials that I'm going to be talking about today are carbene metal amides, or CMAs. And in particular, I'll be looking at this material, which is the kind of archetype of the series, um, CMA1. Uh, it's composed, it's a, it's a donor bridge acceptor type material, composed of a carbazole donor, connected by a metal, in this case, gold bridge, to a carbene acceptor uh, with some kind of bulky groups attached to the side. Um, it, the, the molecule is very similar to um, conventional all organic TADF molecules in that the wave function of the HOMO is largely uh, across the carbazole donor. The wave function of the LUMO is largely across the carbene with some uh, overlap across the metal. So. Um, in the same way as conventional TADFs, we have some geometric separation here between HOMO and LUMO, which can help bring our singlet and triplet energy levels uh, a bit closer together and allow a thermally activated delayed fluorescence uh, emission channel. The presence of the metal and the, the wave function overlap over the metal can um, 
introduce a higher spin orbit coupling coefficient to the material, which can potentially aid in the TADF process, but can also potentially um, allow a phosphorescent um, luminescence process as well. And this could help this kind of potential for, for to have two radiative decay channels from uh, triplet extons can potentially help to reduce the excited state lifetime. Um, so, as, as I've mentioned, the excited state lifetime is a very important parameter when we're assessing uh, triplet emitters. And the way we measure it is through uh, transient photoluminescence. Uh, so we have here a transient photoluminescence decay um, of the range of uh, kind of nanoseconds up to milliseconds post excitation for CMA1. Uh, this is in a solid film, by the way, uh, in, a, in a pure solid film. Uh, the red curve here is at room temperature, and we have varying temperatures down to 50 Kelvin in blue. Um, in this kind of measurement or experiment, um, for a conventional, uh, for a kind of phosphorescent or fluorescent material, we might expect to see a kind of mono exponential decay. And for a TADF type material, we might expect to see a bi exponential decay. Uh, in this case, for the CMA materials, it's, it, it looks like there's something slightly more complicated happening, that there may be a different uh, kind of excited state trajectory towards emission. So what that means is that we might have to think a little bit carefully when we're defining the um, characteristic lifetime of emission, or characteristic excited state lifetime, to be able to compare with uh, phosphorescent or TADF materials. And we can do that if we integrate the photoluminescence over time. And here we've plotted the kind of commutative uh, uh, photoluminescence. And if we define the uh, characteristic lifetime as being the time it takes for the population of emissive excited state species to uh, reduce by a factor of E. So that would be something that would be uh, analogous to an exponential decay. And um, we can do that by finding the intersection between this um, integrated PL and this dotted line, which is the point where the uh, integrated counts are, are, are at the level of uh, one minus one over E. So if we do that, then at room temperature, our uh, CMA1 material has a characteristic lifetime of about 900 nanoseconds. And that's really good. That's faster than most phosphorescent or TADF materials. So that's a really promising uh, property of these, these materials. And we can do the same measurement at varying temperatures um, to potentially look at whether there is a thermally activated component to this emission. Um, so we can, uh, yeah, if we, if we do that, if we find this uh, characteristic time converted to a rate at varying temperatures, we can make an Arrhenius type plot here. And you'll notice that there are two regimes. We have um, one regime at higher temperatures where we get, as we'd expect from an, a kind of a, an Arrhenius type relationship, we get the um, the exponential decay. That's right, well, decay is the wrong word, the kind of exponential relationship between um, the decay rate and the inverse of the temperature. But then in the very lowest temperatures, there seems to be some other regime with a temperature independent process happening which I kind of speculate could be phosphorescent channel, whereas here we have a more uh, TADF type channel. Um, if we fit to this data, we can do so um, either with the, the solid line, you see we have uh, introduced this offset to account for this temperature independent type process, um, and we can extract an activation energy from that fit. Uh, alternatively, if we and kind of neglect these two points and fit only to the um, kind of exponential region, um, we can uh, similarly uh, extract an activation energy from a more kind of normal looking Arrhenius equation. Uh, and if we do that, depending on which type of fitting we do, it doesn't actually make very much difference to the activation energy we extract, which is in the region of 70 to 80 milli electron volts. Uh, and that's uh, very similar and very comparable to um, many uh, very efficient TADF emitters. So 
we are quite confident now that we're seeing TADF emission um, and there's some other channel here, temperature independent channel too. Um, so we want to see what happens when we put these materials into devices. Uh, and I should point out that the first, um, the first published devices uh, using these CMA materials was were made by uh, Da Wei Di and Li Yang, and they were solution process devices. Uh, what I'm looking at here is the thermally evaporated devices, uh, where we have a little bit more control over reproducibility and also um, a little bit more control over different kind of optimization steps we can take and different uh, variations we can make in the devices to reveal some properties of the materials. So this is our device architecture. Um, we have a um, hole transporting layer and an electron transporting layer. Our emissive layer here is a host guest type layer. The host is TCP. Um, and we have additionally have a hole and external booking layer here. Um, so to cut straight to uh, what happens in a device, well, um, the very simple answer is that we can make very nice devices. We have um, you know, low leakage current, nice turn on at kind of roughly three and a half volts, and we can get up to very high brightness as well. And um, in our main kind of uh, figure of merit or metric of device performance, which is the external quantum efficiency, we can get external quantum efficiencies um, over 25%, which is, which is very good um, and indicates that, we get, that we're probably approaching 100% um, internal quantum efficiency. Um, and we can get those high efficiencies even up to practical brightness levels of hundreds or thousand candela per meter squared. Um, the emission here, this is the electroluminescence spectrum, is fairly broad. It's the CT-like uh, emission that we expect. The, the lowest excited state here is a CT-like emission between the homo and the pneumo. Um, and it's kind of centered uh, just beyond uh, 500 nanometers. It's uh, green emission. So as we uh, optimized um, devices and device structures, one of the things I'm sure you can imagine we did was experiment with different host materials to see if we could affect the device performance. And uh, one of the substitutions we made, for example, was between uh, TCP, which is uh, this molecule here, uh, which is a high triplet energy host, and we exchanged it for MCP, which is a very similar uh, molecule, um, just minus uh, a missing kind of carbazole unit here, which uh, does appear on the TCP. So as a result, MCP is a little less uh, asymmetric and uh, is slightly more polar. Um, what I want to show you here is that we got very similar devices using the MCP to the TCP. And um, we again got kind of nice turn on voltages, could get to high brightness and had high EQEs. They were a little bit lower in the MCP than the TCP, but we're still in low to mid 20s. Uh, for EQE, that is. Um, but because these are, you know, they're similar, but not quite as good as the TCP, um, why am I showing you them? And uh, the answer to that is that something strange did happen when we moved into MCP. And that's that the emission color changed significantly. So the uh, electroluminescence has shifted to be, um, you know, just on the blue side of 500 nanometers. And even by eye, you can visibly see the device's sky blue or cyan color. Uh, we're confident that this is CMA1 emission, as, as opposed to, for example, transport layer or host emission, because um, the, it doesn't uh, extend into the UV or deep blue. Uh, the emission is unstructured and still happens with a high efficiency. So um, I just want to leave that kind of color changing aside for one minute and I'm, I'll come back to it uh, very shortly. But at the um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is we, we changed between uh, TCP and MCP hosts, but we also made devices with no host at all. And what you can see here on the right hand side in the external quantum efficiency plot, these red diamonds are our host free device. There's some kind of sub optimality here in the 
low brightness region, which is probably related to um, charge carrier balance. Uh, charge carry balance. Um, but the main point here is that the host free devices, quite surprisingly, are very similar in the EQE uh, performance to the MCP devices. And actually, we um, we have here a maximum uh, EQE for our host free devices of 23%, which, uh, to my knowledge, at the very least, is the um, is the highest efficiency host free uh, OLED reported. And um, it's quite strange to have high efficiency host free devices. For one thing, um, many organic materials show this um, concentration dependent luminescence quenching as you increase the concentration of um, your emitting material in the film, the, the PLQE and hence the electroluminescence quantum efficiency tends to fall off a cliff really. And uh, it's quite unusual to be able to have host free devices like this, which combine firstly a uh, um, an insensitivity to concentration. And we can see that from the photoluminescence quantum efficiency as well. It's not really very sensitive to concentration, even going into host free films, um, but also must combine some properties of uh, charge transport um, where the emitting layer is only composed of the uh, emitting material. Um, so to get back to um, the color changing, <laughs> um, we need to have an explanation as to how or why the color is changing so much. And one thing we can do is, um, or one thing we can think about is the fact that these molecules actually have a very strong ground state dipole moment. They're very polar molecules. Um, the, the dipole moment in the ground state is 15 to by. So you can imagine that in solution, if you have a polar solvent molecule, uh, the solvent molecules tend to anti-align the ground state dipole moment uh, and would stabilize the ground state. But as you move to the excited state, um, something interesting happens that because you have the uh, electron transfer from the carbazole to the carbene here, the dipole moment actually changes direction. Now in a, a liquid solution, you might expect these um, solvent dipoles in green to be able to rearrange and react to the change in, uh, change in dipole moment of our emitting material. Um, but in a, in, a, in a solid matrix like we have in a device, these, what, these host molecules are kind of locked in position. And at least on the time scales of emission and absorption, they, they cannot um, rearrange in time. So if you have a polar host material, you have a stabilized ground state and a destabilized excited state leading to more blue shifted emission. And this is what we think is happening when we change from TCP, a host which is very low polarity, to MCP, which is kind of mildly polar. Um, but this effect has been uh, investigated further by um, Jala, who has a nice paper on it, where he looked at um, a range of host materials going from CBP, which is uh, very non-polar, uh, to TSPO1 here, which is uh, quite a polar molecule with a number of different uh, kind of points in between, including TCP and MCP, which are the host materials we've already talked about. So what Shala found was um, if you go from a 100% CMA1 film, which is this data point here where all the data points overlie, and if you go to the if you go leftwards on this figure, you um, decrease the concentration of CMA1 in any of a number of um, host materials, you get a blue shift. And this blue shift happens in every host. Um, the, you'll see that uh, for the varying host materials, there's a, there's a group here, which are the non-polar hosts, um, CBP, polystyrene, PVK, and you get a blue shift of about 0 0.05 BP from the 100% film to our low concentration in those films. And Jala modeled and showed that this is related to the spacing between CMA molecules um, and the effect that has on exciton diffusion. If you space the molecules out more by having more host material in between, um, there's less opportunity for excitons to diffuse and find lower energy sites to emit from. So you have a higher probability of emission from 
Lua sites. And this effect happens in every host. But what we can see from this plot as well is that you have a grouping of the uh, non-polar hosts here. We have TCP, which is uh, mildly polar, SimCP2, which is a bit more polar, MCC, so MCP PO1, which is a bit polar, more polar again. And then the most polar host, TSP01, shows the greater shift of up to 0.2 EV. 0.2 EV. And that's enough to change our green emitter to be a blue emitter. Um, there's, I will mention as well that MCP here is slightly the odd one out. It is a, a mildly polar material, but according to just ordering of um, molecular dipole uh, strength, it should be here in between the, the orange and the yellow curve. It seems to have an outsized effect. And the, the kind of speculative um, explanation I have for that is that MCP is a smaller molecule than some of these others, and perhaps we can get more, more MCP molecules packing around each CMA1 molecule. So that even though each molecule has a lower dipole moment, perhaps the cumulative effect um, can be greater still. So what we can show here is that we can control the emission color just from the environment, um, the host environment of these materials. And we can potentially push um, emission color towards the blue, which is what we want really in OLED research. Um, the other and I guess more conventional way to change emission color is to change the molecule by molecular design. And we can do that too. So if we have a series of molecules here, where, which are only changing by side group, substitu sub, sub, uh, sorry, side group sub, substitution uh, on the carbazole, we can go from electron donating groups like tertiary butyl to uh, strongly electron withdrawing groups like CF3. And in this series, going from left to right, we can therefore change the uh, CT state energy um, of the, the um, intramolecular CT state energy, which is we expect to be the emission energy for these materials. So to cut straight to um, device color, when we do that for these uh, four materials, we can see that we have the same effects that we saw in the CMA1 for all of these materials. If we start from um, this uh, end, which is CMA4, where we have two tertiary butyl uh, substitutions. We can go from a host-free device, which is quite yellow, and move through non-polar and slightly more polar host, uh, and have this kind of blue shift as we go. And we can do that as we move through the different um, side group substitutions. This is CMA1 again, and CMA5. And um, this final um, material, which I've called here CMAX, um, with two CF3 groups is a bit of an outlier because for one thing, the, um, the points for the host free and in the very polar host, Depepo is a polar host, um, those two points actually lie over each other. It's a bit of an outlier in another way as well. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. I just want to highlight a few of these data points here. So uh, this data point here, the kind of second bluest is uh, the material CMA5 in the Depepo host. And this is a really nice solidly blue OLED. So CIE coordinates 0 0.17, 0 0.17. And we can get a really nice uh, quantum efficiency here of almost 21%. So that's a really great result. Um, and it's a good one to highlight. I'd also like to show you um, the same emitting material, CMA5. We can again do the same trick where we can make um, nice, efficient uh, host free devices. So the color is a little less blue. The color purity is not quite as good. Uh, CAE coordinates 0 0.18, 0 0.27. But again, with fairly high EQE, 17%, 7, almost 17.5%. The third data point that I've highlighted here is this CMAX material again, uh, which is very deep blue. CAE coordinates 0 0.16, 0 0.05. Uh, you'll notice that I have not listed uh, a quantum efficiency here. And that's because these devices are really terrible. They uh, degrade within seconds of turn on. 
and it's uh, too quick, even it's not possible to do the required measurements to calculate an EQE. <clears throat> so I want to look, uh, talk very quickly about the reasons for that and how it can teach us about how these uh, molecules work and how it can inform better molecular design uh, in future. So if we look at, so this is, these are the electroluminescent spectra. It's basically the same information that's on this uh, right hand uh, graph, but just in spectrum form. We can see that as we move towards this CMAX material, we go from this very broad uh, featureless CT like emission to a very structured emission. And you can again see that the, um, uh, the host free device, the emission is indistinguishable from the very polar host of DePepo. Excuse me. So what's happened here is that as we've increased the energy of the CT state, um, we've actually we've gone we've gone too far. So there, there, there are two states here that are relevant. One is the, the CT state, which is uh, what's emitting in most of these CMA materials, and the other relevant state is the local, like the local triplotexton. Uh, specifically on the carbazole ligand. So as we uh, increase the CT state energy with either varying uh, molecular substitution or host environment, we're moving that CT energy closer to the local exciton state, which is largely unaffected by those substitutions. In, um, in conventional all organic TADF materials, there are studies which show that this is beneficial to um, reverse inter-system crossing and TADF-like action. But in our case, what we've seen is that as the um, CT energy approaches and then leaps over the top of the local excited state, it's actually very detrimental. We get this, this emission, I'm not showing the data, but the um, characteristic decay for this emission is very long. It's tens of microseconds. Um, and that's what's causing the um, very rapid degradation of devices. So when we um, when we design new devices, what we need to, uh, new materials, what we need to do is go around the process a little bit more. And if we can find a ligand um, to replace carbazole with, which has a, a higher local excited state, we can hopefully push the emission of efficient devices even further into the blue. We've got some nice blue devices here with CMA5, but really what would be uh, a great result is if we could get this kind of color that we get with CMAX, but from the CT state. Um, so just to sum up, um, we've kind of seen that carbimethylamides um, can be very promising uh, emitting materials in OLEDs with sub-microsecond triplet emission. Uh, we've, we've seen high efficiency OLEDs um, including blue and host-free devices, which is a strange result. The emission color is tunable over a wide range of, uh, over quite a wide range um, by both chemical design and environmental control. But this uh, local exciton on the carbazole um, is currently placing a limit on how far into the blue we can push our emission and push our devices. So this is something to work on um, into the future as to how do we increase that local exciton energy. Um, there's quite a large team have worked on this project and I'm sure I've probably missed some names from here. Uh, to those people I apologize. Um, I want to um, particularly highlight Alex Romanov who's uh, designed and synthesized these materials. Um, I use some data in this presentation from Java and Sol uh, and uh, Dan has um, largely supervised this project and I also used a couple of slides from Dan there which were credited in the presentation. Um, I just want to do one thing very quickly which I know it's unconventional but I have a slide after the acknowledgements. Uh, this is very quick. Um, I just want to also uh, give a promotion to the uh, Girish Lakwani group at the University of Sydney where I am now. Uh, we're part of the um, ARC Centre of Excellence in Exxon Science uh, we're doing work across a fairly wide uh, range of topics in, uh, in optoelectronics. And um, even in the disrupted last year, we've had some good success getting some results out. Um, we 
like to collaborate. We like to work collaboratively. So if there's anyone there who um, is interested more in what we do or would like to collaborate with us, then please get in contact. Um, but I'll stop there now. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, very, very interesting results. Um, I would like to call for any questions from the audience. Can I have a quick question about the thermally uh, activated uh, delayed fluorescence, the TADF. What is it about the uh, molecular motions that causes that? Like, I mean, I'm assuming that it's molecular motion uh, that that cause that. Do you know what parts of the molecules are moving or would that be interesting to find out? Um, yeah, so the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an area of study in a lot of uh, similar molecules, well, not similar molecules, a lot of um, side effects in, um, in a lot of uh, all organic TDF molecules. So the, the predominant picture is that the the in-system crossing or the reverse in-system crossing happens through a like vibrationally assisted spin orbit coupling mechanism. Um, and the, the reason it's interesting as well between the, um, the effect we see in where we change the relative energy spacings between the CT state and the local exciton state is that that's something that's been highlighted in all organic materials where you need you seem to need some kind of interaction between the CT state and the local exciton state um, to be able to um, go through the kind of spin flipping process. Uh, in these CMA molecules, um, there are a number of um, rotational degrees of freedom. So the, the molecule can rotate around uh, this axis between this nitrogen, um, metal and the, the carbene. Um, and I, I kind of, I didn't, I deliberately didn't go into those, those details in this talk. There's, there's quite a lot of detail, there's quite a lot of literature about it. Um, but that can also affect both the in-system crossing rates, the uh, energy separation between singlet and triplet, and the, the oscillator strength as that happens. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a, a quick question? Um, so you, you've talked about the EQEs, um, and there's some really nice EQEs there. Uh, what was the, for the original material that you looked at, which is the one in front of us, what was the solid state um, or the film peel quantum yield for that material? So, well, I can tell you the, I can tell you the PLQY that we measured. Um, I have to say, I think it's an underestimate. Um, so we measured uh, I think in roughly mid eighties, depending on depending very slightly on concentration. Um, now, I'll tell you the caveat to that is that these were measured um, uh, without really a very effective encapsulation, for example, and um, with a, a kind of flow of positive pressure of nitrogen uh, through the integrating sphere. But I I think that the um, concentration of oxygen may have been a bit higher than um, that is optimal for those measurements. So I, I, th I think that the, um, I think those PLQEs are kind of 85 that we measured may be underestimates. And especially because we see the external quantum efficiencies from devices, um, you know, into the mid twenties, uh, that kind of indicates that we're getting, we must be getting approaching a hundred percent internal quantum efficiency in the device. Um, which I don't think would be possible unless we're getting close to 100% uh, quantum efficiency in the, um, in the film. You kind of half answered my sort of follow-up question, which of course is, you know, if it is 80% or even if it's 90% and you're getting 25%, then that implies that you are either having non-Lambertian emission um, and you're getting some sort of optical effect, uh, an optical cavity effect, um, or you are getting some degree of alignment to the emissive dipole. And so have you determined that you are getting Lambertian emission and not an optical effect, or have you got any feel for um, whether you're getting uh, alignment to the emissive dipole? Uh, so I, I know that we do have Lambertian emission and we have measured that. Um, yep. So I know that, that is not the problem. 
or not the, the explanation or reason. Yeah. Uh, in terms of kind of alignment or uh, kind of enhanced outcoupling uh, due to like kind of alignment of dipoles, um, all I really know about that is that we have done um, kind of X-ray scattering experiments, for example, uh, GWAX. So we can see that we have a very amorphous film. Um, whether that means that there's no preferential alignment of dipoles might be a bit of a jump, but um, yeah, it's a possibility. <laughs> we do yeah. see, I, I do know that um, in the solution measurements for, PLQ, for PLQE, um, where it's a bit easier to seal the cuvette uh, against oxygen uh, than it is for the films, um, we do get, um, kind of, I can't remember specifically for CMA1, but we definitely get high 90% PLQ wise over a range of these CMA molecules in solution. Yeah. Okay, thanks Patrick, that's very interesting. Actually, I'm calling from University of Queensland, if any here. So on, on the same topic, actually, I just curious to know, how did you measure your EQE? Uh, the EQE of the- yeah. um, device, device EQE, how do you measure it? Device. Um, it's by measuring the luminescence using a calibrated photodiode at a distance of 15 centimeters, make, making the assumption of Lambertian emission and so integrating over the kind of hemisphere. Okay, so basically it's not with the integrating sphere. It's not with an integrating sphere, no. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, we, we pretty much out of time uh, for our, our sort of two o'clock Queensland time finish uh, for this. Um, I, I do see there's some other questions, Patrick. I don't know if you see the chat window, mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, we have a couple, maybe very, very quickly, if you can. Um, Laszlo Fraser asked about the spin state. Um, he said, uh, you said the spin state is random, 25% uh, occupation in each state, and then says, why is it not in thermal equilibrium or equipartition with 25% of the energy in each state? Um, I might not be able to give a great or <laughs> answer off the top of my head to that, but I think it's probably because the distribution of exton states is related to the spin and not to thermal and um, it's not it's not related to a thermal quantity it's the spin of the um electron and pole um, yeah I, so i, I don't i don't I, I don't think you'd expect the kind of equilibrium pop, like the thermal equilibrium population based on the temperature of the environment and the uh, energy separation it's related to the spin yeah. Um, and uh, second question also from Laszlo. Uh, do we know what energy density causes the degradation? Um, well, I think uh, off the top of my head, I think the... Um, so so en energy density, so, sorry, probably might not be the most... Um, I know I use that word, it might not be the most uh, relevant um, quantity. But I think that the energies at which you start to break carbon-carbon uh, bonds. I'm sure there are lots of chemists here who will probably roll their eyes and say I'm wrong, but um, is I think something of the order of kind of uh, six or seven electron volts. So as soon as you start getting um, like exton exton annihilation events, triplet-triplet annihilation events between triplets of energy kind of getting on over 3EV, you start creating singlet ex excitations which are over 6EV and once you get into that kind of range, you can start breaking carbon-carbon bonds. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we will have to end it there in the interests of time. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for a very interesting talk. Thank